Um, great. Thanks. Thanks a lot uh, for the introduction and thanks for the invitation uh, to speak today to give one of the tutorials. It's great to, it's great to be here. Um, so my talk today is called From Linear Algebra to Multilinear Algebra. And I'll be speaking about some different topics. So as an overview, my perspective today in this talk will be on looking at the challenges in extending linear algebra to multilinear algebra, where I really mean a focus on the algebraic properties of, of tensors. So we've already seen a bit about the numerical side of things, and I'm sure we'll continue to do so in the course of the tutorials. But today I'll be focusing on the algebraic side of things. And I'll particularly focus on various aspects of the singular value decomposition for matrices and how these can be extended to the setting of tensors in different ways. So singular vectors, various notions of rank, uh, low rank approximation, and analogs of these uh, concepts that hold for symmetric tensors. But I don't mind not finishing all of these topics. So I'm very happy if people have questions at any point, that's no problem. All right, so let's start by recalling what's going on with the singular value decomposition of a matrix. So this decomposes a matrix, let's say a matrix A with real entries of size N1 by N2. It finds a decomposition of the form U sigma V transpose, where U and V are orthogonal matrices, and sigma is a rectangular matrix with only entries on the diagonal and all entries non-negative. And if we look at just the ith column of the matrix U and the matrix V, this pair of vectors, U, I, V, I, is a singular vector pair of the matrix and its corresponding singular value is the i diagonal entry of the matrix sigma. Okay, so the type of picture that uh, is typically associated to the singular value decomposition is, is one like this. So I got this particular version from a paper last year of Edelman and, and Wang. And we can see that the singular value decomposition tells us what the matrix A is really doing, how it acts as a linear map. So we have these two vectors, V1 and V2, that give an orthogonal basis of our domain space. And then the SVD tells us exactly what the matrix A does. It sends V1 to sigma1 U1, and it sends V2 to sigma2 U2. All right, and we can write the decomposition of a matrix into this uh, product, also in tensor compatible notations with this tensor product notation. So we view the matrix A as an element of this tensor product space, Rn1 tensor Rn2, and then the SVD writes A as a sum of terms, each of which has the form sigma i, ui tensor vi dual. All right, and the SVD has uh, lots of nice properties that are all uh, interconnected. So firstly, it finds not only a basis so that the matrix A is diagonal with respect to the, this uh, these bases of the domain and, and co-domain, but in fact, this basis is also orthogonal. As I said before, it tells us what the matrix A is doing as a linear map. So we know that it sends some vector V to AV, but this is giving us a nice basis with respect to which we can really understand what this linear map looks like. Other nice properties that it has is we can read off the rank of the matrix A. This is just the number of non-zero singular values. So if our expression looks like this, it's just the number n of sumlands. And 
the best rank R approximation of the matrix can also be seen from the SVD. We just truncate to the top R singular values and we usually put the singular values in order. So then we just uh, truncate to the first R summands. And uh, this is sometimes called the Eckhart-Young theorem. All right, so that's a bit of uh, background on the matrix case. I'm now going to talk about how these different concepts extend to tensors. And I'll start by talking about rank, so how we can uh, see the rank of a tensor. All right, so for uh, some notational ease, I'll focus on the order three case where the tensor has three indices or it lives in a tensor product of three vector spaces. Uh, then the tensor X has rank one if it can be written as a tensor product of three vectors, one vector from each of the vector spaces. And in terms of the entries of the tensor with respect to some basis, this means that the IJK entry of X can be written as the ith entry of the vector A times the jth entry of B times the kth entry of C. And we can write this as a picture like this. So we have that X is equal to the outer product of these three vectors, A, B, and C. And here are some pictures of what the set or variety of rank one tensors looks like. So here's a, a couple of different viewpoints of the space of tensors or a low dimensional slice of the space of tensors. And then the tensors that lie on this surface are those that have rank one. And uh, in this tetrahedron here, you can see the tensors with non-negative entries. All right, but a, a general element of this tensor product space is not rank one. So generally we need to take a sum of rank one uh, terms. And we say that a tensor X has rank R if it's the sum of R rank one terms, uh, but not fewer. So if X can be written minimally as the sum of AI tensor BI tensor CI, where the A's, B's and C's are just some vectors in these vector spaces and uh, similarly to the rank one case, we can draw this kind of cartoon here. And here is a low dimensional slice of a certain space of rank two uh, tensors. So here's the ambient space and then, and then a tensor has rank two if it lies on this surface. All right, but a lot has been swept under the rug in this definition of rank. So later we'll see the different types of rank that occur and the differences between them. Okay, but for now I'm gonna stick to looking at aspects of linear algebra that extend very naturally and directly to, to tensors. All right, so the next thing to look at is a, is a change of basis. So if I have some tensor in this, tensor product of, uh, of three vector spaces or of, of D vector spaces, just with more complicated notation, then I can think about multiplying the tensor X by some matrix, let's say A L in each vector space V L. And I'm gonna uh, use this notation. So we have the tensor X, and then a semicolon, and then three matrices. And the location of the matrix tells us which index we are multiplying along the tensor. So here's the sort of picture to have in mind. We have a uh, tensor X and we multiply it along the rows by A1, along the columns by A2, and along the tubes by A3. And in terms of a basis, if we have some entries X alpha beta gamma of the original tensor, then the IJK entry of uh, this tensor matrix, matrix, matrix multiplication is given by this sum. So we sum over the first index of X 
the matrix A1, over the second index, the matrix A2, and over the third index, the matrix A3. Okay, and another perspective that uh, was mentioned also yesterday is that we can think of the tensor as a multilinear map. So to do this, uh, we can recall the different ways that we can view a matrix as giving linear or bilinear maps. So if our matrix is in V1 tensor V2, then we can view it as a linear map from uh, V2 dual to V1, or we can view it as uh, it's transpose from V1 dual to V2, or we can think of it as the bilinear map that goes from uh, V1 dual times V2 dual, so that takes a pair of vectors and gives an element of the field over which the entries of the matrix are defined. And in our tensor compatible notation, well, in terms of indices, what are these maps doing? Well, here we have AIJ, VJ, here we have AIJ, WI, so we're summing over the first index and in this third case, we're summing over both indices. So we can write this in our uh, square brackets semicolon notation. So here we have our matrix A. We don't do anything to the first index, so that has a identity matrix, but we multiply by V along the second index. Okay, or here we start with matrix A, we multiply by W along the first index, and we leave the second index. And here we multiply by W along the first index and by V along the second index. All right, so how does this extend to tensors? Well, a tensor gives various multilinear maps. We can take some of our vector spaces or their duals and think of them as the domain and other vector space, the remaining uh, vector spaces from our uh, tuple of, of D choices as the uh, co-domain, for example, we could take the map from VD dual to the tensor product V1 tensor dot dot, dot tensor VD minus one. And how does our tensor give rise to such a linear map? Well, it sends some vector V to the tensor in this space we get by doing nothing to the first D minus one indices but multiplying by V along the last index. Or in terms of the entries of the tensor, we uh, get this summation here where we're summing over the last index. Okay, so another possibility is we could take V2 up to VD and then have uh, uh, input be some tuple of D minus one uh, vectors that get sent to a vector in, in V1. So then we take our tensor X, we do nothing to its first index, but we multiply by V2 along the second index, dot, 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 VD along the dth index. So that's what this looks like in terms of its uh, coordinates. All right, and this perspective of uh, multi linear map allows us to think about what the singular vectors of the tensor uh, should be. So firstly, let's recall that for a matrix, our pair of vectors WV was a singular vector pair if multiplying by W along the first index gave a vector that was a scalar multiple of V and multiplying by V along the second index gave us a vector that was a scalar multiple of W. So in the, uh, in the tensor case, we can extend this to a larger number of vectors. And a convenient way to define the singular vector tuples is uh, following this uh, paper here um, of Leckegs from uh, 2005 that says the singular vector the tuples are the critical points of this maximization problem. So we want to take a tuple of vectors V1 up to VD such that we're 
maximizing this scalar we get when we multiply x by uh, v1 along its first index and vd along its dth index, subject to the condition that each of the vectors uh, v1 up to vd should have uh, norm one, where here I mean the uh, two norm. And equivalently, we can uh, uh, study this uh, maximization problem, for example, using Lagrange multipliers to, to see that the condition for being a critical point is, uh, is given by this system of nonlinear equations in the entries of the vectors vi. So we want it to be the case that when we multiply the tensor x by all except one of the vectors vi, so we miss out the k vector, but we multiply by all the others, then this should give us something that's a scalar multiple of the vector we didn't use. And here we can see the importance of imposing that the norms of the vectors are one, because if we rescale all of our vectors by some t, then the left-hand side uh, gets multiplied by t to the d minus one, but the right-hand side gets multiplied by t, and these are only the same in the case d is equal to two, so in the matrix case. Um, I, I can see there's a, there's a question. Oh, hi. Yes. Uh, thank you. I hi. just wanted to ask, in the matrix case, the SVD decomposition is related to the spectral decomposition of the product of transpose. I was wondering if there was something similar in this setting. Um, oh, OK. Um, yeah, so I think that's a very interesting question. So in the matrix case, you're talking about the connection between the SVD and like the eigen decomposition of A transpose A, for, for instance. So in the tensors case, I mean, we'll see a bit later uh, the setting where we can look at symmetric tensors and ask for a decomposition that's symmetric, but it's uh, there's not really a canonical way to associate a tensor to a uh, tensor times its transpose. We could choose various indices and we could contract along one of those indices. So for example, if we multiplied along the kth index, we'd get something, well, if we started with a D by D by D tensor, then we'd get something that's D by D by D by D and, and so on. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting problem to, to study how these different decompositions are related. And this is also somewhat connected to tensor networks and looking at contracting along different indices, but there's not a sort of simple, yeah, a simple answer, let's say. Um, thanks for the question. Oh, there's another question. Hello. Um, so, um, so Anna, um, not being used to your particular notation, um, but coming from the quantum side of things where we use different notation, um, can you remind us what the what the um, uh, contraction rule is in in indices? I mean, if you say it in words on the slide, it's fine. Um, yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. So what I mean by this um, notation is we start with the tensor X, which has D indices, and we multiply by V1 along the first index, and then V2 along the second index, and so on. And then we multiply by VD along the Dth index. Um, yeah, that... no, but I mean, but with the identity means you just don't contract on the case index. Is that what you mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks. All right, so we get these, uh, this system of polynomial conditions of degree d minus one in the entries of our unknown vector that tells us when we are at a singular vector tuple of the tensor. And then its corresponding singular value is given by this uh, scalar we get when we contract along all indices here. And then a natural 
question to ask is, well, how many singular vector tuples does a tensor have? For instance, a, a generic tensor. And for a matrix, we know that we have, well, an N by N matrix has N uh, singular vector pairs. And the uh, analogous uh, question for tensors is more complicated and studied in this uh, paper here of Friedland and Taviani, where it's given as the coefficient of a particular uh, polynomial. All right, so then what about uh, the best rank one approximation? Well, recall that for a matrix, its best rank one approximation is this rank one tensor, the outer product of uh, W1 and, and V1, where the tuple W1, V1 is the singular vector pair with the largest singular value. So uh, how does this extend to tensors? Well, in much the same way, given a tuple of singular vectors, say V1 up to Vd with some singular value sigma, we can associate to it the rank one tensor that we get by taking the outer product of these vectors and then scaling by the uh, singular value. And then it's uh, known that the best rank one approximation of X is indeed the singular vector tuple with the largest singular value. And uh, this is discussed in this paper of uh, De La Fawa, De Moore and Van der Waal from uh, 2000 and, and also in uh, this book of Xi and Liu. And well, just to give an idea, there's a few different ways to think about the proof, but one way is to think about this minimization problem where we're minimizing over the entries of the vectors VI and this unknown scalar sigma. And this minimization is then equivalent to maximizing the inner product of our tensor X with this rank one tensor V1 tensor dot dot, dot tensor VD. And this is the same scalar we get just to revisit the notation by taking X and multiplying it along each of its indices by the vectors V1 up to VD. All right, but then the next question is, what about for higher ranks? So it, all, this is all looking great so far, but we know that things uh, go wrong for higher ranks. So a statement that maybe we'd like to be true, but it's not true, is that the best rank R approximation of a tensor X is the sum of the singular vector tuples corresponding to the top R singular values. So this is not true. Another thing that's not true, but we might like to be true, is that the rank of a tensor X is the number of non-zero singular values. Okay, but if we replace both of these blue words tensor with matrix, then uh, both of these statements are true. Okay, and what are the, what are the problems here? Well, some uh, were already mentioned in the previous talk. So there's the well-known problem that the set of rank R tensors is not closed. Um, there's another problem that a tensor is rarely expressible as a sum of orthogonal rank one tensors. So those that are are known as orthogonally decomposable or ODECO. And uh, another problem, which I think is um, very interesting, not only on the theoretical side, but, but also in, in applications is that the best rank R approximation is not given by doing successive best rank one approximations. All right, so all of these problems contribute to a more complicated optimization problem when it comes to thinking about low rank approximations of tensors, which in turn is an ingredient to extending the singular value decomposition to tensors. Um, yeah, is there a question? No, just, just curious, is it correct to 
view the rank as the minimum number of entries you get in your tensor by acting on row columns and depth by invertible linear transformations? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So that will be an upper bound on the rank. So if you can find some linear transformation such that you only have five non-zero entries appearing uh, with respect to that uh, choice of basis, then that will be an upper bound on, on the rank. But in general, it uh, yeah, it won't be equal. OK, great. So um, I'll say some more about low rank approximation. So we can recall that if we have a sequence of rank R matrices and we take a limit of rank R matrices, then in the limit, the limiting matrix also has rank at most R. But we already saw in the previous talk that this uh, can uh, fail for tensors. Part of me hopes we might see this example in every uh, talk in the tutorials. And so far we're on two out of two, except stated in slightly different uh, notation. All right, so here's the example of a sequence of rank two tensors, which has a limit that has higher rank. So here are two rank one summands. We have the tensor we get by taking the vector one epsilon, tensor one epsilon, tensor one epsilon, and then minus one epsilon, tensor minus one epsilon, tensor minus one epsilon. Okay, so these are two, two by two by two tensors, and we can write them in this sort of grid format. So here, this two by two matrix I'm thinking of as the first slice, this two by two matrix as the second slice. So then the entries of this tensor here are, well, we've got a one and then three epsilons, three epsilon squared and epsilon cubed. And similarly over here, and we can see that if we take the sum and then take the limit as epsilon tends to zero, we obtain this two by two by two tensor here. And the, uh, Last thing to check is that it's not possible to find some other way to write this uh, as a uh, rank two tensor in an exact way. So it's only possible to express it as some limit. All right, and this uh, motivates the definition of the border rank of a tensor. So we say that a tensor has border rank R if it's a limit of rank R tensors. And the set of border rank R tensors has a lot of nice structure that the set of rank R tensors doesn't have. So it's an algebraic variety. More specifically, it's a secant variety of the Veronese, which a few people uh, mentioned yesterday in their introductory slides that they were interested in, in secant varieties. So that's uh, where they come in to the study of tensors. And what does it mean to be an algebraic variety? It means that it's given by the vanishing of some polynomials. So it's a subset of some space on which certain polynomials are zero. Okay, and uh, this perspective is uh, studied a lot in JM's uh, book, and I'm sure he'll talk more about it in his um, talks. And its uh, dimension was proposed by Alexander and um, and the picture to have in mind then is that this uh, is a cartoon of our set of border rank R tensors. So it's a very nice subset of the space that's defined by these polynomials. But certain points in this variety are like this example. So their border rank is not equal to their rank. So we can, we can think of them as some subset of the space like this uh, blue part here. So away from this blue curve, your rank is equal to your border rank and this type of problem doesn't happen, but on this boundary, we have this uh, type of problem occurring. And we can see then that if we have some points in the ambient space and we want to approximate it by something of uh, 
rank are, that maybe we can convince ourselves it's unlikely that we'll land on this particular blue boundary. And this was uh, studied in a paper of Chi and uh, Michalek and Lim, where they say that complex tensors almost always have best low rank approximations. So that uh, gives a justification for our intuition that if we start with a point away from this surface and project it, usually we'll land away from this, uh, from this blue boundary here. But we could also imagine a different picture where that uh, intuition wouldn't hold. For instance, if we had some sort of point like this and the blue part running along some singular locus. All right, but in the complex case, things work out reasonably nicely and we have our uh, best low rank approximation usually. So then what's the problem? Well, for real problems, we usually require real vectors in the decomposition. So we have our rank R decomposition of the tensor X we're, that we're looking for. And we say that a tensor has complex rank R if it's the sum of our complex rank one tensors. So if these, uh, the entries of these vectors are allowed to be complex and a tensor has real rank R if it's the sum of our real rank one tensors. Okay, and it's only worth having these different definitions if they're actually different. So let's see that they're actually different. Here's an example of a real two by two by two tensor that has complex rank two, but real rank three. So here's a decomposition of this uh, tensor here as a sum of two rank one terms. And we can uh, also show that there's no other way to write this tensor as a sum of two real rank one terms. So it's real rank is strictly greater than two. And uh, now the picture to have in mind is, is similar. So this was our cartoon of the set of rank R tensors, complex rank R tensors. And now within this space, we can ask what's the real rank of a tensor. And in general, this space will divide up into pieces where on each piece we have a particular real rank and multiple real ranks can occur with with positive probability uh, so in this cartoon we could imagine that on one side of the blue curve we have one real rank and on the other side we have uh, the other real rank okay so let's uh, explore this cartoon a bit uh, more precisely in a particular example. So we can consider the space of two by two by two tensors. So each tensor then is given by eight entries that we can think of as labeling the vertices of some uh, mini cube like this. So in some eight dimensional space, or none of this changes if we rescale. So we can work in some seven dimensional projective space. And here's now our cartoon from before, but embellished a bit. So the first thing that could happen is that our tensor has rank one. So for the purposes of this uh, cartoon, we'll just draw this as a particular point. So we're rank one if we lie in here. And then the uh, generic complex rank is two. So if we sample a choice of eight numbers in some reasonable way uniformly in the space of all uh, choices, then we'll get a tensor that has complex rank two. So the complex rank is two everywhere in our space, apart from when it's rank one. And when it lies on this particular locus that we saw before, where our order rank is strictly less than the rank. So then we can end up having a higher complex rank. So that happens along this boundary here. And then we also saw before that there are different real ranks 
which can occur with positive probability. So uh, on one side of this boundary here, we have real rank two, and on the other side, we have real rank three. Okay, so the uh, pressing question then to establish from this cartoon is, what is this boundary? So what determines if we're on one side or the other, or in the real case, what is it that determines our rank, if we're real rank two or real rank three? So we're in this uh, set here on, on the left-hand side, provided the hyperdeterminant is non-negative. So the hyperdeterminant is some degree for polynomial in the entries of the tensor that we can compute. It has nice equivariance. So we know the rank should depend on our choice of basis. So neither should our test for a tensor having particular rank. Um, so we can evaluate this, uh, this polynomial and this will give us a test if we're, on, if we're on one side or the other. But also this picture I think offers a nice explanation for the types of questions that we were looking at in uh, the previous tutorial today, which is what happens if you are approximating a tensor by one that's real rank two, but you start outside the space. So we can see from this cartoon what's, uh, what's going to happen is we'll project our tensor onto this boundary between the inside of the space and, and the outside. And we also saw that uh, uh, then our limit or what some algorithm wants to give us as our best rank two approximation is not very good in that it's not rank two. So if we stop at some threshold epsilon, we'll get this rank two tensor. But this is a sum of two rank one tensors that are becoming more and more parallel. Um, and so also before there was some discussion of regularization. So what that would do is limit the sizes of these two rank one tensors. And then your approximation wouldn't land exactly on this boundary, but some distance inside the boundary where the distance would be uh, given by the uh, regularization imposed on, on the two terms. So it's the, the picture shows that it's sort of a bad idea to approximate a uh, real rank three tensor in this space by one that's real rank two, because uh, stopping at some uh, threshold epsilon will give us a, a badly conditioned uh, sum of of tensors and, and the true solution doesn't really exist. So it's trying to approximate a point on this boundary that doesn't have a real rank two. All right, so uh, what then shall we do? Well, we have this set of tensors of real rank at most R and it's a semi-algebraic set, which means it's described by some polynomial equations and inequalities. So now the picture to have in mind is something like this. So this is our nice uh, variety defined by the equations. But then when we add in the inequalities, we get some uh, subset of this variety. And then there'll be some boundary which separates our real rank R part from, from the other part of the uh, of the variety. Okay, and then when we find our best approximation, well, if we start over here, we'll land on the inside of this set, that's not a problem. But if we start somewhere over here, then we'll land on the boundary and that, that is more of a problem. Okay, so what should we do in practice? Well, one possibility is restrict the set of tensors that you're looking at so as to exclude the tensors for which this uh, behavior that we don't want uh, happens. Or another possibility is to use a different notion of rank. So a notion of rank that won't suffer from these kinds of problems. Um, but a, th a third possibility is to 
study the closure of this real rank R set. Uh, and that will give a uh, true best approximation since we're approximating by some closed set. And then we'll need to look at the critical points to the set and also to the boundary. So for example, in the real rank two case, the set itself, it will be some secant variety and the boundary is a tangential variety. Um, there's a question, yes? Um, hi, so I, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Oh, okay, great, okay. Uh, so I may have missed this before, but is there like a analog of, I mean, does this hyper-determinant style condition, does it also work for higher rank or is it, was it specific to rank two? And... Um, yeah, that's a, that's a uh, really good question, thanks. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of interest in general in understanding the equations and inequalities that define the set of tensors of particular either complex or real ranks. So in the complex case, looking for equations, and in the real case, looking for both equations and inequalities. Um, and in, in the real case, very little is uh, known. So in, uh, in this uh, project here, which is joint work with Bernd Sternfels, we extend the hyperdeterminant conditions to real ranks of tensors of any size. So the hyperdeterminant was uh, just in this two by two by two case, but we extend it to tensors of, of any size. Um, and there's been some work, I think by Yang Chi looking at uh, the real rank three case. So the next case up, but in general, I think this is a very interesting problem in uh, real algebraic geometry is to find these equations and, and these inequalities that help to tell us in this big space of tensors, which part of the space we, uh, we land in. Um, and on the equations side of things, so looking at complex rank rather than real, there a lot, uh, a lot more is known, um, and uh, it has very nice connections to uh, representation theory on the space of tensors because we know that the equations that tell us which parts, which uh, rank locus we live on, will have all of this nice equivariance. Um, yeah, so probably JM will talk more about this, but thanks, thanks a lot for the question. All right, so we faced with these different possibilities for what to do. We can restrict the set of tensors. We can think of a different notion of rank, or we can persevere with our real rank R approximation problem. And, and then we need to deal with what's going on on the boundary of the, of the set. Uh, and here deal with means we need to think about how to parameterize the boundary. We need to think about how to interpret if our uh, solution lands on this boundary and, and so on. All right, but now I'll talk about the, uh, the other two possibilities. So restricting the set of tensors and then later thinking about different notions of rank. All right, so we saw uh, before already the idea of an orthogonally decomposable tensor. So we say that a tensor is orthogonally decomposable or ODECO for short, if it can be written as a sum of rank one tensors, where each uh, uh, of the vectors, so v1j up to vnj, that appear in the jth position, let's say the first position, for instance, in each of these summons, have to be orthonormal in the space rnj. And this has to hold for each j. Uh, so there was some discussion before of different notions of orthogonality. This is a pretty strong way for two rank one tensors to be orthogonal. They have to be orthogonal in each vector space. All right, and uh, such tensors were studied in a paper of Zhang and uh, Golub from 2001. Some natural questions are then, well, this is a strong condition to impose, so which tensors have this property? And this was studied in uh, this paper of uh, uh, Borelevi et al. Another question you can ask is what are the singular vectors of such tensors? Uh, 
which we looked at in joint work with Alina Robeva. And since orthogonally decomposable tensors will be a very small subset of the overall vast space of tensors, there are then many natural and interesting questions you can ask about how to generalize some nice properties that these tensors have to, to a broader class of, of tensors. So what sort of properties am I talking about? Well, for instance, if I want to find the best rank R approximation, I just have to keep the top R terms. So that's very analogous to the matrix setting. I have these summands, I order them, in order of the singular values. And then I just keep the top R if I want the best rank R approximation. So how can we uh, generalize aspects of this to, to other tensors? Well, some examples, there's a lot of work in this area, but some examples I think are particularly nice. Uh, so in uh, this paper of Nick Van Heeuwenhoven et al, there's a study of the tensors for which this type of truncation property holds, that if I have a rank R approximation and I'm looking for a rank R minus one approximation, then I take the first R minus one terms that appeared and, and so on. So I can look at my approximations at every rank all together, all at once. So that's a very nice property that you might want a tensor to have. Or for instance, we can impose some weaker orthogonality on the summands of the tensor. So this is uh, studied in this paper of uh, Harm Dirksen where he introduces the DSVD or the diagonal SVD. And uh, finally, we could uh, hope to extend this idea we have for matrices that we can write a matrix as some linear combination of its singular vectors. And in fact, this does hold for tensors. So we can write a tensor X as a linear combination of, of singular vectors. So that's studied in this uh, paper of Dreisbach, Taviani, and Tosino. But in general, this will be a decomposition with many, many summands. Whereas in the matrix case, we get both. We get to write our matrix as a sum of uh, singular vectors and also have that be optimal for the rank. In the tensor case, we have, to, we have to choose between them. Either we get to write our tensor as a linear combination of singular vectors, or we get to uh, express it using few vectors. So we get to look for a rank, a low rank uh, decomposition. Okay, and then other generalizations of the SVD sort of move away from this particular definition of rank as being the shortest sum in a decomposition into rank one terms and think more about the tensor by its flattenings. So if we have some tensor and we are uh, fed up with dealing with all of multilinear algebra being uh, complicated, then we can flatten it to get a matrix which will still capture some of the structure of the original tensor. And there are lots of uh, decompositions of tensors that, that use this perspective. So for instance, there's the higher order singular value decomposition, which is a particular Tucker decomposition that writes our tensor as a product of a core tensor with some orthogonal matrices. So in a way that's somewhat analogous to what we saw before with the change of basis, operation, um, and also to an earlier question, we're choosing a particular orthogonal um, change of basis in each vector space, such that our core tensor has some nice properties. Or another example is uh, what's known as the TSVD, which introduces this idea of tubal rank, where we write our tensor as the product of some other tensors, and then in this case, the core tensor has tubes of non-zero entries, and these taken together are interpreted as the uh, rank of the tensor in a particular way. And then very popular extensions of these ideas are, for instance, tensor networks. And we can have uh, 
the rank of a tensor then being some combination of numbers which tell us the uh, number of uh, summands we need to express our tensor as a particular sum where we're summing over various indices. So this is a large area with many different tensor decompositions studied and tensor networks uh, yeah, have already come up at the program and will continue to. So I won't say uh, much more about them now. All right, so I will now move to talking about symmetric tensors. So uh, recall that a matrix A is symmetric if it's equal to its transpose, or in terms of uh, the entries of the matrix, this means that the IJ entry is equal to the JI entry. And analogously, we say that a tensor X is symmetric if its entries are the same under permuting indices. So for example, if we have a order three tensor with three indices, then we require that this, uh, these equalities hold. So X I J K is equal to X I K J and, and so on. Okay. So Symmetric tensors arise in various contexts, for instance, in looking at the moments or cumulants of some probability distribution, or also in taking partial derivatives of uh, some smooth functions, we'll get symmetric tensors. And for a symmetric tensor, we can ask its decomposition to also be symmetric. So we uh, say that a uh, tensor has symmetric rank one if it can be written as the outer product of the same vector with itself d times, or in this example, three times. So x is v tensor v tensor v. Or in terms of its entries, we have that x i j k is the product v i times v j times v k. Uh, and it can be illustrated by this uh, cartoon here. Or more generally, uh, tensor has symmetric rank R if it's the sum of R tensors of symmetric rank one. So if it can be written as R of these pieces, so let's say a piece with V1 and V2 and da, 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 and VR. Okay, and something we can do whether a tensor is symmetric or not, is look at the uh, singular vector tuple conditions, but in this symmetric case. So we can define the eigenvectors of a tensor to be the uh, critical points of this tensor vector contraction we get by multiplying by the same vector V along each of its indices and imposing that the norm of V is equal to one. And then there's various analogous questions you can ask, like how many eigenvectors does a tensor have or which vectors can arise as the eigenvectors of a tensor and, and so on. Uh, yeah, question? Yes, I wanted to ask, in the matrix case for symmetric matrices, there's a very nice geometric interpretation in terms of the principal axis. Is there, is there a ge geometric interpretation here for these symmetric tensors as to the decomposition? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, as, as always with tensors, the idea of this kind of decomposition is that each of the summands contribute towards the signal of the tensor in some way. So that's sort of in, in general, but then for a specific application, the vectors 
do something specific. So for example, in looking at moments of uh, probability distribution, there's work by uh, Anand Kumar et al, where the entries of these vectors are uh, interpreted as the conditional distributions in a uh, uh, model with a single hidden variable. So then the hidden variable is thought of as having R states and each of the summands give the conditional distribution or rather the third order moment of that, of that conditional distribution, um, having fixed the value for the hidden variables. Um, let's see, so the other example is looking at the partial derivatives of a smooth function. I mean, there you can think of, in the matrix case, you have the Hessian and the uh, vectors that appear in your uh, decomposition, then give you, as you said, these axes along which the principal axes, let's say of the Hessian and something analogous to that it will extend to uh, these tensors of, of higher order um, derivatives. But I think it's a, I think it's a very interesting question uh, to uh, think about some more. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk lots more about this offline. Maybe, oh yeah, maybe I'll stop there, but thanks a lot. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, great. So then uh, let's, uh, uh, well, I've uh, introduced this definition of symmetric rank. And then before we saw ranked, so how does rank and symmetric rank compare? Well, recall that a symmetric matrix of rank R has symmetric rank R. So we don't get, if we start with a symmetric matrix, we don't get anything extra by doing the SVD compared to doing the eigen decomposition. We'll get the same number of, uh, uh, of summands appearing in these two decompositions. So then it's a natural question to ask, does the same thing happen for tensors? And what's known as Common's conjecture says, or said that a symmetric tensor of rank R has symmetric rank R. So let's say X is our symmetric tensor, then we have two choices. We can either respect its symmetry and decompose it as a sum of symmetric rank one terms, or we can ignore the symmetry and decompose it as a sum of non-symmetric rank one terms. And the question is, can we do better, i.e. can we find a decomposition that is shorter or a rank that's smaller in the non-symmetric case compared to the symmetric case? Okay, and this is known to be true in some cases. So for uh, low ranks, for instance, it's uh, known to be true, or also uh, some results are known about uh, generically when, uh, when this is true, provided the rank is, is sufficiently small. Um, but this is also known to be uh, false in, uh, in general. So here are the examples that are known so far, which are both due to uh, Cheetov. So I would say that these examples highlight perhaps how little we know about tensors and their ranks rather than how much we know about tensors and their ranks. So the first example is in the complex case. So we have a tensor whose complex rank is 903, but its symmetric rank is at least 904. And in the real case, we have a real tensor whose real rank is 761 and whose symmetric real rank is, is 762. So there's this wide gulf in between these special cases where we know this conjecture to be true and these particular examples where we uh, know um, that the conjecture is, is false. Um, so yeah, I think this is a, a very interesting uh, topic to uh, examine 
other possible examples, uh, for instance. But yeah, for instance here, so we can imagine that we've got some sub sum of 761 terms, whereas over here, we've got a sum of 762 terms. So that's what's going on in this uh, and these counter examples. Okay, so I'd like to uh, sort of gradually wrap up my talk by uh, mentioning the connection between uh, symmetric tensors and polynomials. So if I have a symmetric tensor, uh, which has size n by n by dot dot by n, so it's order d, then I can associate to it a homogeneous polynomial, which has degree d in n variables. And the way I can do this is I start with my tensor t, and then I multiply t uh, by this vector of indeterminates x along each of its indices. So in the notation from before, this would be this square bracket notation t semicolon x, x dot dot, dot x, but now x is a vector of indeterminates. So it's a vector of unknowns rather than a particular uh, vector of interest. And if my tensor was symmetric, then this is actually a bijection. So given this contracted uh, polynomial of degree d, I can recover the entries of the tensor that I uh, started with. All right, and this uh, is familiar in the case of a symmetric matrix. So if we start with a symmetric matrix on the tensors side of things, then we can associate to it a quadratic form where the quadratic form is x transpose mx, where x is our vector of indeterminates. Um, so our matrix corresponds to something of degree two. Similarly, if we start with an order three symmetric tensor, we can associate to it a cubic polynomial under this correspondence. If we start with a rank one tensor, then this gives us a polynomial with some uh, particular structure. So it's a linear power where the coefficients of the linear form are the entries of the vector V from our rank one tensor. And then extending on the linearity, we have that a symmetric decomposition of a symmetric tensor. So writing our tensor as a sum of VI, tensor VI, tensor, tensor VI, gives us what's known as a wearing rank decomposition of the polynomial. So it writes the polynomial as a sum of powers of linear forms, which uh, as we'll see is something that uh, was thought to be very interesting in uh, classical algebraic geometry and and now by connecting it to tensors we can see that it has a, a persisting interest to us today. So uh, a special case of this correspondence is if we start with a four by four by four symmetric tensor. So this cartoon that we've been seeing throughout the tutorial, then this corresponds to a uh, cubic surface. So this is a surface defined by the vanishing of a uh, homogeneous polynomial of degree three in four variables. Um, let's see, was there a question? Yes, there was. So in the, I mean, I was referring to the wearing rank. So in the matrix case, if the if you look at the spectral decomposition, for example, you know the left you have some eigenvector, right eigenvector on the you have some left eigenvector. I mean, and they are related. I mean, the matrix is inverse of the other. I was wondering in here, looking for decomposition in terms of products of linear forms, do we also want this uh, inverse relationship among the rows uh, of the different linear factors? Okay, okay, yeah. I, I see what you mean. So I think what you're talking, if I understand your question correctly, 
there's different changes of basis operation that we could do. So we could think of a change of basis on the linear map represented by our matrix M. And that would involve this similarity transform X inverse M X that you're talking about. But we could also think of the change of basis operation that's most natural in the context of the, the bilinear map that's uh, defined by the matrix M that sends a pair of vectors to a scalar. And there, the natural change of basis is, uh, this, is this congruence action, X transpose M X, where, okay, X was a bad choice of letter, but then the matrix is M. Okay, so Y transpose M Y, where Y is then the linear transformation of the, of the space. So it's, um, yeah, it connects nicely to this perspective of equivariance that Le Keng was talking about yesterday, that thinking of the tenses in different ways gives rise to a uh, different type of equivariance on the structure that we that we might look for. Uh, does that does that answer your question? Um, yeah. So then, uh, seeing all these linear and multilinear maps that arise from a tensor, we could um, go through and ask what's the correct transformation that respects a change of basis in each of the in each of the vector spaces. Um, all right, so I uh, would like to conclude by uh, sharing a very classical perspective on tensor decomposition. Um, so uh, before we look to the future and the exciting long program ahead, we can uh, look to the past and the middle of the 19th century. So we saw on the previous slide that there's this correspondence between four by four by four symmetric tensors and cubic surfaces. And that a symmetric rank decomposition of a symmetric tensor corresponds to writing our polynomial as a sum of powers of linear forms. So a particular case of this was, was studied uh, by Sylvester and, and others, and is called Sylvester's pentahedral theorem from uh, 1851. And it says that a generic cubic surface, or more specifically, the polynomial whose vanishing locus gives us the cubic surface, can be decomposed uniquely as the sum of five cubes of linear forms. So we can write F in the form L1 cubed plus L2 cubed plus blah, 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 plus L5 cubed. Um, or equivalently, its corresponding four by four by four symmetric tensor can be written as the sum of five symmetric rank one tensors. And this decomposition is uh, unique. Okay, so uh, I'd like to share something about the uh, proof of this um, result. I, um, I think this is the original uh, proof, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. This is, this is uh, perhaps a later perspective of Segre. But anyway, so uh, one possible proof of this is we can compute the Hessian of our polynomial F. So this is some, uh, the matrix we get by taking the second order partial derivatives. And so this is a four by four matrix of linear forms. And so the, the Hessian is uniquely determined from the polynomial uh, F. And the idea is to find these linear forms that appear in the decomposition from the Hessian surface. So here's an example. This is a particular uh, Hessian uh, surface, the uh, degree four polynomial we get by taking the determinant of this, uh, of this matrix of linear forms. And we want to locate the linear forms Li from this surface. So the, uh, the, the surface has 10 lines. So for example, you can see a couple of lines uh, here and maybe there's some behind there as well. So it's got 10 lines along which two of the linear forms vanish. So let's say Li equals Lj equals zero. And it has 10 singular points on which a triple of linear forms 
vanish. So for example, there's a singular point there and, uh, and there's one there as well. So um, yeah, this gives a very classical uh, perspective, let's say, on tensor decomposition and also uniqueness of a decomposition and how to obtain the decomposition um, in a way that's a bit, uh, yeah, a bit different from um, our modern toolbox. All right, uh, so I'll finish up by sharing some uh, outlook. What does the material in this tutorial, what's it supposed to say? Well, that we can extend aspects of linear algebra to tensors, so to multilinear algebra. But we need to choose the most important properties for some context of interest. For example, is it orthogonality we really want, or is it low rank that we want, or, uh, or something else? And this could be seen as a bad thing. In the case of matrices, we get a lot of structure for free, that even if you're looking for a low rank approximation, you can get orthogonality for free. For tensors, this doesn't happen, but I think perhaps it's an opportunity in that it encourages us to think about the structure that we really need for a particular context or application. Um, and I will talk more about applications in my second tutorial talk um, next week. Um, and so the uh, image I would like to leave you all with is this, that we have this vast space of tensors and it divides into these semi-algebraic subsets on which particular properties of interest hold. So here are some examples of this space of tensors and our locus of, uh, of interest. And then by understanding what this locus looks like, for example, by giving some algebraic description, we can see what goes wrong when we try to, uh, let's say, optimize a function over this set or uh, approximate a, a tensor not on this set by, by uh, one that is. All right, so that's it. Thanks a lot.